Hallelujah. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. I am yours.
today. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, the Son of God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Thank you, Father. We've come to worship you today, Jesus. We've come to exalt you today. We've come to lift you up because you are worthy of our praise. Thank you, Lord, that you brought us a mighty long way. Had it not been for God, we wouldn't be here today. But we thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy of God. We thank you, Lord, for the awakening that you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to do it, I pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let's worship him today. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship.
Don't you appreciate the fact that it doesn't matter what you're facing, Come on. what you're going through, Come on. how dark the night may be, how deep the valley may be, how wide the river is, Come on. it doesn't matter what we're facing. God says, I will never leave you. <laughs> I will never forsake Hallelujah. you. No matter what you're facing. Hallelujah. Now we're all human. And there are times and circumstances and situations and things happen. And I'll be honest with you, there have been times that I thought, I thought maybe God failed me. I mean, we're human. We've all felt that. I don't understand. Even if it's in the form of I don't understand or why, God. Why? When we ask God why, I don't care what the circumstance is. If we ask God why, we're questioning his judgment. You say, is it wrong to do that? Absolutely not. No. No, we got real quiet. Come on. It is absolutely not wrong to question God. Amen. Because God, His love and His grace and His mercy is big enough <laughs> to handle all of our questions. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. It's big enough. And I'll tell you something, God may not he may not give you the answer to the question, but he'll always give you his presence to give you strength and comfort in life. And just remember that. He said, after all, after all, you are constant. Listen to me, and I'm, I'm going to move on with the service, but I want you to hear this. In this world, there's nothing constant except for God. Amen. Nothing. Amen. And he gives us hope. His presence with us gives us hope far beyond this world. He is constant. And the reason why he's constant in time is because he's constant in eternity. That's right. And that's the difference. Elder Shannon, I just want you to pray. I want you to pray that God's blessing would be upon us and pray God's blessing on every person and on this service. Will you do it, please? Thank you. Father God, we thank you this morning because of the fact that you are constant. Father, everything in life changes, but not you. Dear God, 42 years ago, I gave my heart to you. And Father, you've been so faithful to me. God, you've, been, you've, you've, you've carried the big end of it. And I thank you, Father, because I sure wouldn't have made it this far without you. But God, I know, I know that soon we'll all be standing in your presence. One way or another, dear God, it won't be long. But Father, until, until then, help us, dear God, to be obedient to you, to serve you, to build your kingdom. Dear God, in every way that we can, Father, we love you. We loved you yesterday. We love you today. We're going to love you tomorrow, Father, because you loved us first. Dear God, when we were yet unlovable, you loved us. Father, so we pray this morning, dear God, bless the church. Help the church. Help the family stone this morning, dear God, that are in bereavement. Father, be with them as only you can. Dear God, give them your loving care. Father, bless those that are in physical need this morning. Dear God, touch them and help them. Dear God, bless the preacher this morning as he breaks the bread of life. Father, may many souls be won. Dear God, today, and your, may your kingdom be added to and built. Help us, Father, in everything we do. We'll always be careful to praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Would you take just a moment, please, and welcome our online congregation. Let them know we're glad that they're with us today. I want to say from my heart to yours and from the depths of my heart that, that I, I, I don't have the words to, to even express my gratitude for all the the overwhelming love and support, concern, the kind words, the cards, 
the people that drove to Welshton to the viewing and come to the, the others that came to the funeral. And some came to both. And just so many wonderful things that everyone has done uh, to help me through the time of my mother going to heaven. And I, I just, I, I don't know what to say other than to say thank you and I love you from the depths of my heart. And I really appreciate it so, so very much. We had, uh, we had a tremendous service. I, I won't even call it a funeral because at times it was more like camp meeting than what it was, more like church than what it was just a funeral service. Uh, my mama was one of those old shouting saints. And so you can, you can know that we had some shouting going on. There's something to shout about when someone goes to heaven. Amen. Amen. So I, I appreciate it so very much. Ushers, I want you to get in place. Father, I thank you and praise you for this offering. I thank you that it's going to be more than enough to meet every need of this ministry and further. That we can, we can push back the border. That we can proclaim the gospel. That souls will be saved. That your covenant would be established. That your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Life Change Church. I just want to welcome you all to uh, today's final message uh, with the sermon series Awakening. I know you all have enjoyed uh, the past few weeks. And I want to encourage you, uh, you know, if, it, if it, these messages have helped you in any way, um, we certainly want you to pick up copies of those and pass them on uh, to people uh, that you know that could certainly benefit uh, from this sermon series. Also, we've got a couple of uh, things going on this evening at 430. If you have not uh, gotten involved here at Life Change Church or you want to just come and check out uh, maybe some, some information, find some information out about the church or, or figure out what that next step might be for you. Uh, we want to get you plugged in. We want to get you connected. And that's what Next is all about. So you can be here this evening at 430 um, right here at Life Change Church for Next. Also, coming October 12th, um, we have our Group Link event. Uh, our Group Link event is where we uh, connect you to a community group. Uh, we're so uh, passionate here about building community, and one of the main ways we do that here at Life Change Church is through our community groups. Even if you're not sure whether or not you want to get into a community group, please come on out, fellowship with us, spend some time um, getting to know somebody new. Uh, we want to see as many people as we can at this group link coming up October 12th, and we hope to see you there. I got back about 11 last night from Haiti. I was down there all this past week. And, and uh, while, while I was there, um, I talked with our pastor in, in Pakistan. And uh, I just want to let you know that God is using Pastor Troy here in Batavia to impact pastors in the world. And uh, in Pakistan, people are being saved by the hundreds in there. He is using pastor's sermons and uh, uh, this awakening series. He told me this awakening series is awakening Pakistan. And uh, it is awesome to see that happening in Haiti. There's an awakening going on. God is saving souls. And it is amazing what God is doing. And listen, church, we need to be encouraged but challenged by that. Because where would we be if our source of getting the Word of God was YouTube or the Internet? And yet we come in and we sit here week after week after week and we hear the sermons and we hear the Word that God is giving Pastor uh, through His Word. And, and I, I just want us to be challenged to be changed. Allow God to move in your spirit and move in your life. Uh, it's incredible what, what, what messages God is giving through our pastor. And I, I tell you, we're very fortunate. We're very blessed people. And uh, I haven't done this song in a while, but this week I was praying there beside my bunk bed in the, in the ministry house in Baudelons, Haiti. And uh, God just stirred this song, and I just began to worship him uh, early uh, one morning this past week by singing this song. And I just want to sing it this morning. You can sing along because I know a lot of you know it. Thank you, Lord, I just want to thank you, 
I just want to thank you, thank you, Lord, you've been so good. I just want to thank you, I just want to thank you, Lord. Can you sing that with me this morning? I just want to thank you, even in the storm, you I can just thank God. Want to thank you, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, I just want to thank you, Lord. Today I can clearly see. How God has taken care of me How many times He's boarded my ship And said peace to the stormy sea All the things that matter most Like my Lord and family You see how it all I've been blessed I've been blessed indeed I am where I am today. It's obvious the love of Christ, His mercy and His grace. All I had to offer Him was so minimal, you see. So I can say, I've been blessed, I've been blessed in It's obvious the love of Christ, His mercy and His grace. All I had to offer Him was so minimal, you see. So I can say, I've been blessed, I've been blessed in Good. 
If you would turn with me, please, to Jonah chapter 3. We're going to conclude our sermon series entitled The Awakening with our final message out of Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> We're going to begin reading at verse 5. Would you stand, please, in reverence of God's word? Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying... Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that's in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of that evil, that he said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. for your word, for your spirit. You're so faithful, faithful to communicate truth to our hearts. And I pray that some way, somehow, as only you can, you'll touch my frail mind, frail flesh. Help me to preach. I pray, God, that you'll touch each and every person. Help them to hear. Would you embed deep within our heart and spirit the seed of your word? May it spring unto everlasting life. And we'll praise you forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The entire course of the world has been affected by spiritual awakenings. A spiritual awakening is when the consciousness of community toward the things of God are elevated. The fear of God sweeps through like a tornado wind and many are brought, if not hundreds and thousands, are brought to the genuine knowledge of Christ and His saving grace. And often it would happen in a short period of time. What would take weeks, months, years to accomplish takes place quickly. By a sovereign move of God's Spirit. I suppose we could review and talk about all the reasons why in our culture, in our world, we need a spiritual awakening, a Christian renewal, a cultural reform, character restoration. We could talk about why we know we need this corporately, nationally. Worldwide. But let's talk about the individual. Because the fact is man's heart is so dark and filled with hatred for God, so numb by his own love of sin that he ignores the restraint of God's word and God's way, God's will, God's law. He does not listen nor hear the life-changing message of Christ that is proclaimed all around him. Churches everywhere, Bibles everywhere. And it is totally disregarded and ignored. Man continues in his own rebellious way and regrettably we reap the consequences of it as we fail to hear the voice of God speaking through Scripture and revealing to us that the only hope any of us have is Christ and Him crucified. 
What we really need is a divine intervention, as it were, a sovereign move of God and awakening where God arouses us out of our apathy, where he awakens us from our slumber and our sleep and causes our conscience to be heightened with what's going on, not only in our lives, but all around us. We need a move of God's Spirit that's unparalleled and unprecedented because of the deep, dark, sinister soul of man and the condition of our hearts and our lives and our absolute disregard for what is right and living in a day when when that which is right seems wrong and that which is wrong seems right and it's all twisted and altered and diluted and we need an awakening much like Nineveh did I suppose that Nineveh and our world runs a striking parallel they were they were brilliant people Great architects and artisans, they had constructed a magnificent city that far exceeded its ancient time and was way ahead of its time. They had walls that were 200 feet high and they were so wide that, that, uh, that chariots could, could three at a time go around the walls simultaneously. Their prowess and military power was unmatched in the world at that time. But yet they were so wicked. And one of the things that caused them to be so wicked, probably not the cardinal sins that we think, one of the things was they had an absolute disregard for human life. What God had created in his own image. I want to tell you something. How we handle one another is very important to God. And God called Jonah. He had to find somebody. Jonah, I want you to go down. I want you to preach against this city, this great city. Preach against it. Jonah rebels. He gets on a boat, goes to Tarsus. If it's not a portrait of the church right now, at least in America, if it does not portray exactly where we are on a boat going opposite of what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. And hear me and hear me well. We will do a lot of things. And there are a lot of ministries that we perform as churches. And even our church, there are a lot of things that we do. But when we stand before God, there's something primary, principal, that's on the forefront of the heart and mind of God. He's going to want to know exactly this. What did we do with the proclamation of the gospel? And believe you me, children, that's not just on me, that's on all of us. You and me. What did we do with the preaching of his son, Jesus Christ? What did we do with the proclamation that Christ saves? What did we do with the blood cleanses? What did we do with the proclamation of the gospel? That's at the forefront of the heart and mind of God when it comes to the calling of God on every church. It's not on the forefront of our mind. Most people, the forefront of our mind was they didn't really recognize me. They didn't shake my hand. I didn't get invited to the lunch. I was getting real, real quieter. It's already quiet. I said quieter. We're on the boat going the opposite way, and God was displeased, and he sent his storm. He throws him overboard. A fish swallows up Jonah, and... Finally, after three days at the bottom of the sea, Jonah comes to his senses, worships God in the fish's belly, and God spits him up right there on the shore. And Jonah goes into Nineveh with a message. It's a short message. He was not like me. (laughs) He preached short. 
And I can see it. It was about a day's journey in that he was only halfway through the city. But I don't know exactly how he preached it, what he preached, the words that he used, the phraseology. I don't know, but the, but the message was this. It was one of urgency. Jonah walks in, and I can see him. I guess it's in my mind. It plays out in the theater of my thinking. He's walking through, through Nineveh, and he lifts his voice, and he says, God says, because of your sin... And because of your wickedness, in 40 days, this city will be overturned. God said, because of your sin and your wickedness, his judgment is imminent. And in 40 days, this city will be overturned. My word, what it would be, what would it look like if one more time in America, God would raise up some preachers, not sermonizers, not pretty preaching. I'm talking about some prophets that would hear the voice of God and speak as of the oracles of God, that they would hear what God says and speak it. I remember growing up, almost every preacher I ever heard would say something like this, I'm not in interested in giving you a sermon, but I do want to bring you a message. A message. Oh, we need 10,000 preachers again in America that will take this book in hand and say, God, what do you want to say to the people today? I'm not talking about getting a sermon off the internet, out of a book somewhere, out of the quarterly. I'm talking about prophetically hearing the voice of God and saying, thus says the Lord. And I want to tell you something this morning. I believe with all of my heart. It's not pretty and I wish I can preach it better. But this whole series, I know for a certainty, is God speaking to us. Maybe it's one last chance to have a real, genuine revival move of the Holy Ghost that will awaken our heart, arouse our spirit, cause our community to come alive toward God. And thousands of people come to the knowledge of His power, His grace, His love, His spirit. I feel like preaching this morning. God help us today. The message was one of judgment and urgency. Urgency. We bury our head in the sand. We push them up in the clouds and pretend everything's okay. I want to tell you something. You can fill a Coke bottle full of strychnine and pretend it's Coke, but that doesn't mean it won't kill you. In fact, if you drink enough Coke, that might kill you. This is going over like a lead balloon. Believe me, I did not want to start off the fall preaching this sermon series and emptying out my church. It's not what I wanted to do. But that's exactly what it does. Real quick. People won't come hear this. Why they won't come hear this for? When they can go down the street and hear nothing. And do nothing about it. I'm preaching the truth right now. The message was one of judgment and urgency. I, I wish, I wish we would get it. I just, I lay awake at night and it pesters me at festers in my heart. I wish we could get it. We don't realize how close we are to losing it. Yeah. Here in America, we're losing it. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. It frightens me. We're losing it. The thing that frightens me the most is we're not frightened. The thing that bothers me the most is we're not bothered. It's as if our spiritual eyes have become so diluted to the dark, we've adjusted, and now we're so, we're so much more used to darkness than what we are light. It's like going into a movie theater, and once you're there for a little while, things, uh, your eyes dilute, and you get used to the dark, and you walk out in the brilliancy of the sunlight of the day, and your head starts to hurt, and you're like, give me some, I can't hardly stand it. And that's where we are in the church when a preacher gets up and preaches truth uh, and light. We're so used to the dark that our eyes, uh, you can't hardly stand it. What are you talking about? Don't talk don't say that preacher don't say that don't say that i have to say it we have to say it 
we got to shine a light. It's real dark. we got to shine a light. Open our eyes. Quit shutting the eyes. We're close. Do we not hear it? These days I feel like a mute talking to deaf people. That was Jonah. I want to tell you, it's going to take more than a preacher hopping around screaming and crying and carrying on to get people to wake up. It's going to take a move of God's spirit. Amen. Only God can do it. Amen. And then Nineveh, God moved. And here's what happened. This is the sermon. That was all introduction. Amen. This is the sermon. There was an awakening message. And let me tell you something. The awakening message was not Jonah going into Nineveh and saying, if you'll plant a $1,000 seed in my ministry, then you're going to be able to build 400 foot high and have five chariots. I'm preaching the truth. That's not an awakening message. That's fill up some cat's bank account message. Woo, I'm on fire with this thing. You hear me? That's not an awakening message. God's spirit moved, but even when God sovereignly moves, it takes the response of the people. And the people responded. Now, I'm going to give you a simple message today. It's nothing new. And I don't know that we need a new revelation. We need to be reminded of what we already know. I'm going to give you what they did. Number one, are you ready? Here's how the people responded to the message. Number one, they believed. They be the Bible says they believed God. The voice of God was this. God spoke 40 days and this city will be overturned. And the Bible says they believed God. Listen to me, church. We need to believe God. Amen. Believe what He says. We ought to believe this Bible right here. From cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. I want to tell you this morning, I make no apology for it. I believe this is the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. It is the oak of God planted in the mountains of eternity, entwining its roots around the rock of ages. And as a little boy, I sang it, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. I believe this book. When it says what I am, that's what I am. When it says what I can have, that's what I can have. When it says that Jesus died for my sin, I believe he died. When it said he rose again from the dead, I believe he rose again from the dead. When it says he's coming back, I believe he's coming back. When it says if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart God raised him from the dead, I'll be saved, then I'll be saved. When it says the promise, I have the promise. When it gives a command, I ought to obey the command. When it gives a precept, I ought to line my life up with the precept. I ought to believe what God has to say. Believe it. They believed God. We're not going to have a move of God's spirit, a revival, an awakening until we believe God. Do we believe him? Do we believe him? They heard the message. The city's going to be overthrown. Something touched their heart. Fear. Touched their heart. Godly fear. That's what's missing. From the positive all the way to the negative things, that's what's missing. 
Let's talk about the promises for just a moment. Believing God's promises. Do you understand that believing God's promises takes a measure of respect and fear for God to do yeah. to, to receive the positive things. For example, if I'm going to believe that God will supply all my need according to his riches in glory, then I have to have a healthy fear for God to believe that all my needs are going to be supplied by God. If I don't have a fear for God, then what I'm going to do is believe that my needs are supplied by me. And not God. It takes a healthy fear. And then when it comes to the judgments of God. If I don't believe God. I don't have a fear. I'm not concerned. And, and listen to me guys. This is just the reality. I, I hope that you know that I love you. But the reality is. That's where we are. Our head is buried in sand. And it's lofty in the clouds. And it's just. Everything's going to be all right. And that fear and respect and concern and urgency is not there. When they heard that message of judgment, they believed God. Amen. Secondly, you know what they did? They repented. They repented. Everyone say repent. How many, can I ask you a question? Yes. How many times does God have to say something? How many times does God have to say something for it to be true and important? I had someone say to me one time, well, it's not in the Bible very often what we were talking about. It's not in there only once or twice. I said, do you understand you must be born again is only in the Bible once. But everyone in this building knows that you've got to be born again to go to heaven. It's in the Bible once. There's salvation in different places. But you must be born again. as one time. God only has to say something once. Everyone say once. Yeah. Only has to say something once for it to be right and important. Now think about this a moment. God in his word. Over 500 times. In word, action, inferred. Over five, five, five hundred times. Five, you that are online, type it. Five hundred times. Those of you who are going to watch it on TV, five hundred, five hundred, five, zero, zero, five hundred times. God. Says it, infers it, shows it over and over, repeats it over and over in the Bible. This thing of repenting over 500 times. Isn't it interesting that we have a land full of preachers preaching what they say is the Bible, but yet we very rarely anymore hear anybody say anything about repenting. It seems to me that if you're reading a book that talks about it over 500 times and you're explaining that book to people every week for 52 weeks, it appears to me if I'm going to explain a book to people for 52 weeks just by volume of subject matter, And it'd show up. You would have to say it. You couldn't avoid it. You couldn't. It's like you can't literally to avoid repentance. You, it's, a, it's a constant juggling match. I mean, you have to pit, pit, pit and pull things out of context and twist to avoid preaching repentance. You, it's, it is a job. He said it over 500. But yet even in the presentation of the gospel these days, just That's right. ABC, ask, believe, confess, ABC, ABC, how worse they are. It just doesn't rhyme very good. It doesn't go very good. ABC, R. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to explain to you is we get nowhere with God without repentance. 
It is the message of every prophet in the Old Testament. He explodes on the scene. It is repent. Do you realize that from Malachi to Matthew, God was silent for 400 years? Not even a breath from heaven. Not a sigh. Not a grunt. There was nothing. The heavens were glass. God did not say one word. But when John the Baptist explodes on the scene like some flaming meteorite out of the wilderness, what's the first thing God said? Read it. John said, the prophet of God preparing the way for Christ. John said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The first thing he said. I mean, God doesn't say anything for 400 years. 400 years, nothing. And then the first thing he says, the first word out of his mouth. Repent. kingdom is saying, Jesus, what did he preach? What was his sermon? Can somebody tell me? It's in your Bible. What was his sermon? I'm going to take this chair apart for me. Get that chair for me. Thank you. What was his sermon? I'm going to say, what are you doing? I'm sitting down. You get to. What was his sermon? Repent. Repent. The kingdom's in. The first thing, first thing he says, repent. That's what Jesus said. Hey, the first sermon ever preached in Acts. The first one. Everyone say first. first. When the church was born. The church of Jesus. First sermon. What was it? Repent. Peter. You guys are catching on. <laughs> Peter gets up. Says you crucified him. God raised him from the dead. He went back to heaven. Sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And Peter said judgment is coming. Urgency. See. He said one of these days the stars. I wish somebody would hear me. One of these days, he said, the stars are going to fall out of their socket and drop to the earth. The moon's going to turn to blood. The sun's not going to yield forth any light. And the trumpet of God's going to sound. And that one you crucified and crowned him with a crown of thorns, he's going to come back riding a white steed. And on his vestige will read King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to come back. He's going to come back. He's going to come back with healing in his wings and judgment in his voice. He's going to come back. He's going to set all things straight. He's going to make all the wrongs right. He's coming back, Peter said. He's coming back. And the people, the people were on the edge of the seat. They weren't sitting down. They were standing up. It was different that day. But we're the context to where we are. They're sitting on the edge of the seat. The same Jesus. He's coming back. Yes, he's coming back. Whoa, what the, Peter! What do we do? Peter, tell us, please. What do we do with this? We don't know. What do we do? And Peter said, he said, repent. Chris, he said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. The first gospel message. Was repent. What's it mean, repent, preacher? It means this. You guys ain't wanting to go anywhere because I'm having a good time preaching. This is my old life. This is who I was. This is what I did. This is sin, darkness, the world, rebellion, 
Away from God. That's what this is. This is what we're going toward. This is what humanity. We're all going away from God. That's Jesus. That's the cross. Here's what repent. It's a military term. It means this. If my back's toward God and toward Christ and I'm walking away and walking according to my own self, my own flesh, the world's sin, and on and on and on it goes, what it simply means this, uh, to repent, it just means I'm going to turn my back on what I was, who I was, where I was going, what I was doing, the life I was in, and I'm going to go that way. Now I've turned. It's a 180. I'm changing. I'm changing. And I'm going to walk back this way. That's what it means to repent. It is a change of mind. Which results in a change of heart. Which will result in a change of action. Jesus said it this way. Here was his call later on to repent. If any man will come after me, it is strongly inferred in those words. If I'm going to go after Jesus, I can't go after what I was going after before I started going after Jesus. It is absolutely impossible for a man to go after that and after that at the same time. You have to be willing to stop going after that in order to go after that. What do we need, preacher? We need the preacher to hurry up. What do we need, preacher? We need corporate national repentance if my people who are called by my name, people, plural, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. But more important this morning than national corporate people repentance we need to be like David. Create in me personal repentance. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then I'll Then I'll teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted. Amen. I take that hanky now. Those lights are bright, you know. Working myself like a borrowed mule this morning. I can't even get you to smile. What did the people do? They believed God. They repented. They repented. And they did, lastly, the only thing they could do. And that was plead for God's mercy. The king said, maybe God will change his mind. If we change our mind, maybe God will change his. I think it's interesting, Elder Shannon, that the king did not take for granted that God even would. I think it's interesting that he did not take for granted God would even do it. He questioned, perhaps, maybe, will God, if we turn, if we repent, if we believe him, if we do, will God change his mind and not destroy us? Will he? Listen to me. I know the last few weeks I've preached real strong. 
God is a God of judgment, and righteousness, and right, and justice. That's the whole message of Jonah. But let me tell you the real message. The undertow. You see that river flow there in Jonah, you see judgment and justice. Forty days and half. But the undertow of that message. What's driving it? What's you know what I'm talking about? It's one thing to see the top of a river, but the power of that river is underneath. That undertow. You know what the undertow of that river in Jonah is? God's mercy. Hey, if God was not a God of mercy, everybody in this building would already be in hell this morning. God wasn't a God of mercy, I'd be dead. It's God in his mercy who says, I, if you'll change your mind, I'll change my mind. If you'll turn, I'll turn. If you'll reach up, I'll reach down. Huh? God's sovereign grace and mercy. Right before they were to be destroyed, 40 days. I've got to quit. I was uh, preaching one night. And a youth pastor was there, had his family. He just had two little twin boys, beautiful little babies. They were maybe, maybe two or three months old at the most. And we did what Christians do, you know. We're limited what we can do. But the good thing is we're allowed to eat. I love to eat, don't you? I don't know if I eat to live, live to eat. I do love pizza. Someone said pizza. I just know that there's going to be pizza in heaven. <laughs> Wouldn't be heaven if it wasn't pizza. God knows that. He made me to love pizza. When I get to heaven, every pizza place I go in, if you ever go eat pizza with me, everywhere I go, I'll eat it once, and then I, then I can tell them, I am a pizza connoisseur, I can tell them exactly what to do with that pizza to make it better. Is that not true? Ask man, she's like, I don't even, she's, I don't even like that pizza until you tell them how to make it, and now it's, now it's great. I'm a brilliant pizza man. I just know when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell them how to make the pizza. God's going to reserve that for me. He's going to say, make it poorly, angels, so that Troy can tell you how to make it. <laughs> but we didn't go get pizza. We went, I think it was Gold Star or Skyline Chili. There's another thing of the devil right there. there ain't going to be no Skyline in heaven. I like Skyline. I sin every time I eat there. You know, the first time I ever had Skyline, I thought, you know, I don't think I like this. The second time I had it, I thought, that's not bad. The third time I had it, I said, that's pretty good. By the fourth time, I'm addicted. <laughs> it's like they lace it with cocaine or something. <laughs> I don't know what they do. Now I have to have it once or twice a week. I mean, I literally go in, expose the vein, and tell them to put it right in. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? You're not entertained at all, Norma. <laughs> we went and got some skyline. And there's a little girl there at the church helping with those babies. I'll never forget it. Unbeknownst to her, someone had taken that baby out of the car seat, and when they put the baby, laid the baby back in the car seat while we were eating, they hadn't restrained the baby. And that little girl got out of the chair and she came along and picked up that car seat and when she did that baby tumbled out of that car seat and his little soft little head was headed straight toward the tile of that restaurant floor and I don't know if it was sheer athletic ability or the grace of God on that daddy that daddy ran across that floor and right before that little baby crushed its head on the tile floor he grabbed one of the ankles Went like that. He lifted him up. The baby cried and cried and cried, and we all sighed. 
and the baby was fine. But listen to me. As soon as that daddy grabbed his ankle and lifted him up and we all sighed a sigh of relief, I mean, just a moment later, they were, it would have been devastating. As soon as that daddy did that, God spoke to my heart. And he said, Troy, that's exactly what I did for you. When you would be destroyed, spirit, soul, body, my mercy reached down just in time. Listen to me. That's exactly what his mercy will do for you and you. It's what it did for Nineveh. 40 days, I mean just a few more days, and their head would have been crushed. It would have been over. The whole city destroyed. But because they believed God and repented, God in his mercy, just in time, lifted them back up. I don't know who you are or where you are with God today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you've been. I don't know how low you are, how high. I don't know any of it. But I know this. I know that there are many of us here this morning that need to come to this altar and throw ourselves on the mercy of God and say, God, have mercy on me. Yes, amen. Have mercy on me. There's a lot of us that need a personal revival. So here's what I'm going to do. This is a little different. I'm going to have him come. He can sing or just sit there and hit a chord. I don't care what he does. But I'll tell you this. At this moment, I'm going to let just the Spirit of God do what He wants to do. And if you need to pray, like these Ninevites did or anybody else, if you need to pray, if you need the mercy of God, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come forward and kneel right here as we sing. I'm, just, I'm done. I'm going to sit down and let God do what He wants to do with you. Jesus.
want you to listen to me. I'm going to let you go. And you, you can go anytime. But I want you to listen to me. It's in these moments of great devastation and loss and hurt. I've heard people say, I've heard people say, well, God's testing our faith. No, no, God's not testing our faith in the devastation and loss. He's reminding us of the reliance of our faith. He's not testing it. It may test it, but it's not, God's not testing our faith. He's reminding us it's in these moments faith is what we have. Faith is what we have. Church, I, I, in regards to this sermon series, it's, I, I've never preached a more important one. I wish I'd have preached it better. And I, I don't say that to get anything. I just want you to hear it. I plead with you. Claremont County needs revival. I'm not arrogant enough to say that God's going to use us to birth revival all over this nation. I, I, just, I just wish he'd let us do something right here. I wish we, I wish it, we, we need to change our hometown. Amen. You know what? And then let God do what he wants to do. Amen. I want you to stand with this family. I love you guys. Everybody stand with me. This family's gone through a great loss this week. Well, I say loss. not lost I remember the morning that great young man walked this aisle right that very aisle right there and knelt right here and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior I want to tell you now and I, I you know we'll, we'll talk about that later on of all the things that young man accomplished and what an incredible kid he was I just such an amazing kid one of the things that was so amazing about it, she loved to hear me preach. <laughs> I loved that kid. He was phenomenal. I'd always tease him and his girlfriend every time they walk out. I said, you still with him? <laughs> but all the things he accomplished, the heart and the drive he had, the best thing you ever seen him do was when he walked that aisle put faith in Jesus. It's the best thing you ever seen him do. I want you as a church family, just lift your hands toward this family and we're going to pray for them. Pray that God will strengthen them and encourage them in this time. Father, I thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for this great family. They, I'm, I'm impressed by their faith, God. I'm impressed by their faith. Grandpa, a friend, sister, a girlfriend, a mama. I'm impressed by their faith that after such pain and loss, here they are. And their faith is strong in you, Jesus. And I thank you for that. All that I wish we had church for with that kind of faith. And I thank you for the faith that they, they're showing us and the resolve that they have in Jesus. And I pray that you'll honor their faithfulness, God, and would you wrap your arms around them and pull them close. Give them the strength and the grace that they need. Hold them up in this time. Lift them, I ask. And Lord, as a church family, we'll take their arms too, just like Aaron and her, and we'll lift them. Let them know that, they, that they're loved, not only by you, but by us. As we leave this place, I pray that your spirit and presence would go with each one. And may each of us look to you and trust you in and for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go ahead and sing them out the door, will you? Spirit of the Lord.